Part 1 Going to hear a conversation between an agent and Scott. First, you have some time to look at questions 1 to 5. Now listen to the tape and answer the questions. Howdy, what can I do for you? I'm here to ship some things back to China. OK, we can do that. Shipping things back, eh? Have you lived there before? Yeah, I lived there for three years and came back two years ago. Now I'm going back to start my own business. Really? Did you ship things with us last time? No, I used a Chinese shipping agency. Well, I'll just let you know that rates have changed recently. So I don't know if they'll be comparable to what you pay before. It doesn't matter to me. My company's paying for it. Aha. Uh -huh. Then it's nothing off your skin, right? OK. I'll need your name and where you need to go to pick up the items to be shipped. My name is Scott Linder. L-I-N-D-E-R. And I live in upstate New York, Saratoga Springs. Oh, sure. I know that place. I go to the races there. Great town. What's the zip there again? Double seven o four two five. And the street address is 412 West Lake Road. 770425 Westlake. Got it. And how big of a container are you going to be looking for? Well, I didn't have a container last time, and I don't think I'll need one this time. I think that I'll have about six cubic meters. We can get a subsection of a container then. How big is that? It's two meters wide and three meters long. Two meters high, right? Yes, sir. Now look at questions 6 to 10. As the talk continues, answer questions 6 to 10. And for customs, I need to know what sort of items will you be shipping? Mostly furniture. But we'll also have quite a few boxes of books too. Any clothing? Nope. But we'll have some bicycles and wood that we use for a loft bed. Be careful with those bicycles. I hear bicycle theft is a big problem in China. Not if you know how to secure your bikes and where to store them. Well, good luck. How valuable do you want me to list the entire shipment as being? Let's say about three and a half thousand dollars. Great. Now you'll also have to go over to the customs department to check with them about shipping the wood over to China. I know there are concerns about termites, bugs, etc. No problem. It's the same wood I brought over from China last time. Then you should be OK. It's just a formality. And last of all, where would you like the shipment to be delivered? Well, I will live in Beijing, but let's ship it to Tianjin. My company will pick it up there. That's all right then. Have a nice trip. Thanks for your help. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part two. Part two. We'll hear some students discussing an assignment. First, look at questions 11 to 14.
Listen carefully. Well, Fiona, we certainly have a lot of work to do this weekend.、Mm. I wish now I hadn't spent so much time on my other assignment. Don't say that. You did really well, eighty percent. Yes, but this is different. It's not hard, really. It's just all a bit of a rush. We had loads of time to get the other one right, but this one is all a bit pressured. That's what makes me anxious, despite the preparation we've done. You shouldn't worry. What could go wrong? Look, let's look through what we can do to make sure it's okay. Well, the main difficulty that's bothering me is about defining the terms of reference.、Mm. It's supposed to be about approaches to social welfare, right? Yes, but we're not expected to give a survey of what that means. That's not the point. We're supposed to be comparing the way welfare is approached in collectivist societies and what you might call capitalist societies. So we can concentrate on just that contrast. Yes. The other thing that bothers me is that I'm not really committed to either view. Well, I have strong opinions of my own, but that's not supposed to colour my judgement. How do you mean? Well, what you write for this is supposed to be unbiased. It specifically says that you shouldn't give a personal view. But Professor Green has a personal view. Yes, but that doesn't mean that we have to agree with him, and I don't think we'll do any better if we do. And how long does it have to be? The maximum is four thousand words. What? But that's the maximum. We'll probably end up with about three, but at least two thousand is the minimum. Shouldn't be a problem. Hmm. Okay. Before the broadcast continues, look at questions fifteen to twenty. You will now listen to the second part of the talk. Now, where can we get some information on all this? Well, we could ask Olive over there. Olive, you did this assignment last year, didn't you? Not this one exactly, but something similar. <sighs> the most important thing is to get Professor Green's lectures on the welfare state. Is he good? Oh, very good. Didn't you know he was lecturing? No, no idea. Well, he is. He's at the Beckett Building on Tuesdays. I think he's starting this week, so you'll be able to get the series of six. He deals with the underlying philosophy as well as the economics of it all. It's at ten a.m. I'd go myself, except that I have too much to do. And what about reading? I've got the reading list here. As usual, it has far more titles and references than we can possibly read in the time. I haven't even got a reading list. Where did you get that from, Mike? I got it at the welcome lecture. Oh, I wish I'd gone to that now. What you need above all is his own book called Welfare Economics. All the department know it and follow his approach. Oh, right. Good idea. Perhaps we don't need to go to the lecture if we have his book. No, I really do advise you to go to his lectures as well. Well, what was the full title of his book?、Mm, if I remember rightly, it's called simply Welfare Economics. By Mike Green. I've got it. Welfare Economics, Glenfield University Press, two thousand and six. Great. Let me just write that down. Anything else you recommend?、Uh, there's Edward Jones's book,、um, Growing Old in Britain. That's essential reading, but you have to be careful because it's a popular book by a journalist. Well, if it's popular, maybe we'll like it. Who publishes that? That's published by Rutland University Press. In two thousand and five.、Oh, well, that's very useful. I think it's Professor Green for us next. Right. That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part three. 
Part 3. You will hear a radio program in which the speakers discuss the importance of looking after old people in winter. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 24. Now listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 24. Now listen and answer the questions. Nobody likes cold weather, but for old people it can be particularly uncomfortable and dangerous. They can become cold without even noticing it. To keep warm, they may need help from friends and neighbors like you. To find out how we can help, we've invited a representative from the Social Service Department at the town hall to talk about the Winter Warmth Code campaign. Mr. Hastings, can I first ask you why it is so important to keep an eye on elderly people during cold weather such as we've been having lately? Yes. There are two main reasons. First, the old suffer from the cold more than the rest of us. They're not as active or strong as you and me, and it's harder for them to keep warm. This can lead to all sorts of complications. They have less resistance to infection. The quality of their lives is badly affected, and in extreme cases, they may need to be hospitalized. According to the newspapers, old people are actually dying of the cold. Is this true? I'm afraid it is. I said before there were two main reasons why we should keep an eye on old people. Well, the other major problem is that so many pensioners cannot afford to heat their homes properly. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 25 to 30. Now listen and answer questions 25 to 30. They may already be living in difficult circumstances. Then, in an exceptionally cold winter such as this one, they may just not have enough money to pay for the extra heating necessary. It seems terrible that in a society such as ours this should be happening. It is. And what the Winter Warmth Code campaign aims to do is to bring this problem to the attention not only of the government but of everybody else in society. We all have a duty towards our old people to make sure that they do not suffer in this cold weather. So now to the practical side of things, what can we do to help? Well, we all know someone old, a relative maybe, a neighbor, Someone living round the corner. We should adopt that person and make sure that we spare a few minutes every day to check that everything is okay. Make sure, even if the old person is not actually ill, that he or she is not suffering. Check when you go inside that the house or flat doesn't feel cold to you. It's a good idea to try to feel some part of their body, like their face or hands. Old people can become cold without even noticing it, you know. Okay, and if a person is too poor to afford to heat the house or flat, the best thing then is for the old person to live in one room only, and to make sure that that one room is warm. Check that the bed is on an inside wall. Move it yourself if necessary. Check the room for drafts. A lot of cold air gets into the room through old windows or badly fitting doors. Is food important? Yes. Make sure that the old person is eating well. You could help by cooking for them or doing the shopping. Remember, 
A good hot meal a day makes a big difference. Also, make sure that they are well dressed. Old people need to wear more layers of clothes than we do, particularly at night. One last question, Mr. Hastings. Is there nothing the state can do to help? Oh, yes, indeed. Contact your town hall to find out about local organizations already involved in this kind of work. If there is a local Meals on Wheels service, for instance, you could get your adopted old person on the list. Then, of course, there are also many state benefits which an old person could be entitled to, and which he or she doesn't know about, and which therefore he or she is not claiming. An extra problem here is that it can often be complicated, and old people don't like going to Social Security offices to fill in forms and all that. You can help by finding out for them what possibilities exist for claiming a little extra money from the government, then applying for it for them. That little extra could make all the difference. Yes, indeed. Well, Mr. Hastings, thank you for coming in and talking to us today. Thank you. That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part four. Part four. You'll hear a lecture about Iron Age in Britain. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40. Now listen carefully to the message and answer questions 31 to 40. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Today I am going to introduce to you a special age in Britain, the Iron Age. People at that time, you may be surprised to hear that, seem close to the men and women of today because archaeologists discovered that they tried to vary their diet, improve their homes and follow fashions. The period known as the Iron Age lasted in Britain for about 800 years, from 750 BC to 43 AD. There had been several dramatic changes by the end of the Iron Age, including coinage, wheel thrown pottery, etc. People had started to live in larger and more settled communities. Furthermore, because of the differences in climate and geography, Someone living in Yorkshire or Ireland would have eaten different food, worn different clothing, and lived in different housing conditions from someone living in southern Britain. Caesar commented that Britain was a land of small farms, and this has been proven by the archaeological evidence. Since Iron Age society was primarily agricultural, it is safe to presume that the daily routine would have revolved around the maintenance of the crops and livestock. Small farmsteads were tended by and would have supported isolated communities of family or extended family size. They produced enough to live on and a little extra to exchange for commodities that the farmers were unable to provide for themselves. For those farms, harvested crops were stored in either granaries that were raised from the ground on posts or in bell-shaped pits two to three metres deep. Some 4,500 of these storage pits have been found within the hill fort interior at Danebury in Hampshire, and if they were all used to store crops, this would have essentially made the site one large fortified granary. Although the archaeological evidence shows that cattle and sheep would have been the most common farm animals, it is known that pigs were also kept. The animals would have aided the family, 
not only with heavy farm labour, in the case of the cattle, such as the ploughing of crop fields, but also as a valuable form of wool or hide and food products. Horses and dogs are also observed in the archaeological evidence from both faunal remains and artefacts. Horses were used for pulling two- or four-wheeled vehicles, carts, chariots, while dogs would have assisted in the herding of the livestock and hunting. Besides agriculture and stock raising, the architecture in Iron Age is also worth mentioning. A very well-preserved settlement has been discovered at the site of Chiselster in Cornwall. It was made up of individual houses of stone with garden plots. In Wessex, the typical building on a settlement would have been the large round house. All of the domestic life would have occurred within this. The main frame of the round house would have been made of upright timbers, which were interwoven with coppiced wood, usually hazel, oak, ash, or pollarded willow, to make wattle walls. This was then covered with a daub made of clay, soil, straw, and animal manure that would weatherproof the house. The roof was constructed from large timbers and densely thatched. The main focus of the interior of the house was the central open hearth fire. This was the heart of the house to provide cooked food, warmth and light. Because its importance within the domestic sphere, the fire would have been maintained 24 hours a day. Beside the fire may have stood a pair of fire dogs, such as those found at Baldock in Herefordshire, or suspended above it a bronze cauldron held up by a tripod and attached with an adjustable chain. The ordinary basic cooking pots would have been made by hand, from the local clay and came in varying rounded shapes, occasionally with simple incised decorations. As for eating, bread would have been an important part of any meal, and was made from wheat and barley. The dough would have then been baked in a simple clay-domed oven, of which evidence has been found in Iron Age houses. The barley and rye could also have been made into a kind of porridge. In addition to this, the grain was also fermented to make beer, and the surface foam that formed was scraped off and used in the bread-making process. The interior of the house was an ideal place for the drying and preservation of food. Smoke and heat from the constant fire would have smoked meat and fish, and would have dried herbs and other plants perfectly. Salt was another means of preserving meat for the cold winter months, but this was a commodity that could not be made at a typical settlement. Well, you can see that Iron Age people lived a decent life, didn't they? I'm going to introduce their culture and leisure time next time. Thank you. That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answers.